Today I'm hosting Maxim Samorukov, a Carnegie Fellow, temporarily living, working in Belgrade with the Ukrainian, Russian, Belarus hub of the Belgrade Center for Security Policy to talk about the war in Ukraine, internal, political, social and economic consequences of this war in Russia and the role of Russia in the Western Balkans. Maxim Samorukov is a fellow at the Belgrade Center for Security Policy and at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, specializing in Russia's relations with the states of Central, Eastern and Southeastern Europe. From 2015 until 2022, he was a fellow at the Carnegie Moscow Center based in Russia until the center was closed down by the Russian authorities. Before joining Carnegie in 2015, Maxim worked for the Russian independent media. He worked as a correspondent and an international columnist, covering topics including Russian foreign policy, its relations with Central and Eastern Europe, as well as the Balkans. He obtained his master's degree at Moscow State Institute of International Relations. Welcome, Maxim. Uh, by now, you're practically a Belgrader. Can you tell us about the life of the growing Russian community in Serbia? Are you welcomed by the local community here? Hello, yeah, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, actually, yes, it's quite a pleasant experience to live in uh, Belgrade, I have to admit. And actually, initially, I, I, I chose Belgrade as a place to relocate from Russia because I expected that there would be no problems with my Russian passport, first of all, here. And it proved to be true. Yes, I, I haven't faced any problems with my Russian citizenship, any problems at all, actually, on, on the every, uh, level of everyday life. And um, what I know from my friends who have, uh, and equate, uh, Russian acquaintances who have also moved to Belgrade, and there are quite a few of them, uh, they are also very happy about the relations with the local community and they have not experienced any problems, difficulties, acrimony or something like that. Only right. welcoming, friendliness and all this stuff. And uh, so you mentioned other Russians. Do you think what's your intuitive impression? Uh, are they intending to stay in, in Serbia or are they using Serbia as many migrants and refugees did already in 2015 as a sort of a springboard to go somewhere else in Europe, North America? I'd say this Russian migration is quite different one from the one you experienced in 2015 because it's usually more educated and uh, uh, more well-off people who mm. are going to Serbia and they know how to take care of themselves. It's just they need some country which is not at war <laughs> to live in, yeah? And I, uh, of course, most of them are quite young and it's very difficult to predict how long they will stay here. But from the, my experience, from the people whom I know, uh, most people plan for several years here at least and then they'll see, yeah? But as their first experience is quite pleasant, I, I expect that quite a big share of the Russians who have arrived uh, all, uh, in this year to Serbia may stay here mm. for, for, for their lives. Because it's turned out, for them, it uh, first turned out uh, that uh, it's not that hard to move out of Russia, mm. especially to Serbia. Mm. And the second, it's a quite pleasant place, uh, quite a European one, with a quite comfortable life, especially in comparison to such big and tensious megapolises as Moscow. So they're enjoying it. Yeah, so. I must say, after the <laughs> October Revolution in 1917, if we hadn't have had such an influx of uh, Russians fleeing and other people fleeing from what was then becoming the Soviet Union, we wouldn't have had <laughs> a lot of our cultural sphere. For example, in Serbia, it was quite a uh, poor peasant country at the time, you know, agricultural country. So say, for example, Comic books. Mm. I'm an enormous fan of the comic <laughs> books. It's well known. I draw as well. Well, if we didn't have for the Russian emigres, we wouldn't have a Serbian comic book at all, for example. For the, and not to list, you know, other spheres of art. So yeah, actually, this is also an important factor that there is no big cultural gap. It's quite easy for a Russian mm. to integrate into local life and there is no resistance in the local community against Russian integrating in such a life. Right, yeah, right, welcome. So it's 
quite the, the cultural gap between the two nations is not very big, mm. so it's easy mm. to stay here, co comfortable in mental relations. So, so that that links up with what I wanted to ask yeah. you next, because they've asked you this question before, um, because you you fled essentially from uh, regime in Russia to Serbia to find yourself in a country where. Putin is viewed by many as some sort of a superhero. So, uh, uh, how do you feel facing this when you see Z shirts on the streets and what? Over not that many, actually. Not that many. Not that At many. the beginning, there were there were more, but now not that much. And I think I have, no, I have no problems <laughs> with that. I personally, at least, because I realize quite well that uh, this Putinophilia. Uh, has very little to do with real Putin and a lot to do with recent Serbian history. Yeah, it's much more about Serbian history than about Russian reality. So these people are kind, kind of expressing their uh, personal experience, not, not their, their real knowledge of Russia. Uh, and uh, also, I don't feel entitled to lecture locals how they should feel about uh, the world. It's actually I'm moving here, not, <laughs> not the other way around. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Uh, so, Maxim, are we living in a Cold War 2.0 or are we at the brink of World War III right now? I'd say neither. Mm -hmm. Just I don't see as a really world war, at least yet, and I don't see any prospects of it becoming world war. It's still, in essence, it's a regional war with a quite active participation of the West, but most of the world is not really directly involved, even if Russia is using Iranian uh, drones or something like that. Yeah. Uh, rather, if you want historical analogies, it's, mm -hmm. I think it more looks like uh, Yugoslavia war on steroids, something like that, which, <laughs> right, which was postponed, <laughs> for three postponed for three decades and finally exploded. <laughs> But something more like that. Because I don't just what is there is no way to escalate into world war. Russia is alone. Russia is also isolated, uh, and uh, even uh, its closest military allies in the post-Soviet space are not ready to join Russia militarily. Mm -hmm. uh, even Belarus is not mm -hmm. joining Russia militarily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, how, how would you judge the situation right now? Uh, after the Kremlin organized referenda in eastern provinces of Ukraine and, you know, declaring them official part of the Russian territory. Are we closer or further to the end of the war because of that? I'd say the intention of the Kremlin when annexing these territories was to achieve a ceasefire or some pause in the war, to escalate in order to be able to stop it for at least for a time being. Mm. Because uh, even the Kremlin realizes that uh, the war is not going according to, to the plan, to the initial plan, and uh, that uh, the Russian military resources at the moment are exhausted, and Russia needs some time to replenish armory, to train new soldiers after mobilization and all this stuff. So Russia would be, uh, this action, yeah, this annexation was intended to raise the stakes to put some pause in the war, mm. yeah, to, to put it on pause. Uh, but I don't think that uh, Russia has achieved that. Yeah, we don't see any signals that Russia is any closer to achieving that, because Ukraine see no reason to stop its offense, which is so far successful. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a lot of talk and fear about this all over Europe, really, and uh, <laughs> broader. Is Putin going to use tactical nuclear weapons or something of the sort if pushed to a corner? I think we are, bo we are far still far away from both things you mentioned in your question. He's, he's still far away from being pushed in, in a corner. Mm -hmm. And despite the current defeats on the battlefield, Russia still has a lot of resources yeah, to, re to replenish its military strength. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that the, Ukrainian, the future Ukrainian uh, offense will go that Easily, yeah. mm -hmm. there is no no science proving that. Yeah, it's, Russia is still able to mobilize a lot of people, and we have seen in this war is that despite all the technology, the sheer numbers I of soldiers also matters a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in this respect, Russia is far better positioned than Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think that Putin Putin still ha still has a lot of space, a lot of other steps to take before nuclear option. Yeah, mm -hmm. because this is his last trump card. 
Right. Uh, and uh, I think now the threat of using nuclear weapon is much more useful for him than the real use of nuclear weapon. I mean, was, even he himself, yesterday, just yesterday, he told that he, he saw no, no military sense, neither military sense nor political sense in using nuclear weapon. And actually, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, exactly. I don't know how, how reassuring it sounds, but <laughs> <laughs> especially I, coming from him personally. <laughs> I, I, I guess the, hu you know, the, 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 the human ordinary person part of me you know uh, <laughs> wants to be reassured but uh, for the purposes of the interview uh, your answer is uh, actually right to the point <laughs> it's um, uh, there are two ways in which wars end uh, with victory of one side and the defeat of the other or they can end with armistice how do you think this war will end eventually? Actually, th this war has already had so many un totally unpredictable turns, <laughs> so I, I can hardly predict the, the final outcome, which is, I'm pretty sure, years from now. Yeah, we still the very beginning of the process. Uh, but I, I can hardly imagine a total defeat of a nuclear power. Uh, it's, the stakes are too high. Uh, if, you, if you try to defeat a nuclear power, you risk uh, destroying the whole planet. Exactly. So uh, I think it can go on and on for years, because like, uh, just even if Ukraine just keeps, uh, it manages to uh, conquer, uh, to liberate all the territories conquered by Russia before that, till its borders of 1991, for example, mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't mean that Russia will stop yeah, and will say, okay, we have no objections to that, we, we are ready to put up with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think as long as Putin is uh, in power, he's personally obsessed with the Ukrainian issue, um, he'll keep this conflict going on, because it, 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 it's already this conflict has eclipsed everything else for him. Mm. So as long, he ha as long as he has power, he'll keep just this conflict at least simmering. So even a ceasefire, a ceasefire maybe is possible for Russia to uh, replenishes resources, but uh, final solution is years from now and very difficult to predict. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because th that, that really um, leads me to the next question, because you s mentioned many times uh, uh, until Putin is in power. And so after the announced mobilization with so many Russians seek refuge abroad, Many came here, actually. Uh, uh, I was the other day uh, going out of the flat where I am, and uh, uh, several Russian people came to visit the flat where we were at before. So, <laughs> as I could see already, people uh, exactly fleeing from the mobilization. And uh, uh, is the increased human cost of this war likely to provoke at a certain point an internal rebellion in Russia? Uh, I don't think so. It's just because of, uh, there are a lot of Russians fleeing in absolute numbers, but in relative numbers it's a very small fraction of Russian population. Mm. The estimates are maybe, even the highest estimates are around half a million of Russians fleeing the mobilization, but half a million of Russians is in a country of 150 million is uh, less, much less than 1%. Mm. So uh, that's the first point. The second point is that uh, the human costs are sure to increase public discontent in Russian society. Uh, but even with a very high level of public discontent, uh, there are no instruments in Russian system of power Mm -hmm. to convert this discontent into some meaningful political change. You, you just, uh, everything has been, all the political infrastructure has been destroyed over the past decade. Mm -hmm. And you don't have real elections, uh, you don't have political parties, uh, all media, the last free media, independent media were closed down over this, over this year. So how you can convey, even the high level of public discontent, how it can be conveyed to those in power, to the Kremlin. I, I see no ways to convey it. And you know, public revolt is, Russia is already an urbanized and quite old society. Yeah, with a nuclear family, when the most families have only one child. With this demographic situation and uh, uh, social situation, these societies are not likely to go revolting. Yeah, it's, 
uh, not Central Africa. Yeah, it's just uh, going to revolt and uh, arm, ar arm themselves. I can hardly imagine that happening in Russia. We saw, uh, on that note, we saw a protest over the mobilization in uh, Dagestan, for example, in some republics where you would have a different, uh, um, you know, um, a demographic situation, yeah. I would say. Uh, are we likely to see maybe some discontent in some of the, let's say, mm, provincial parts of the federal Russia where minorities uh, are? Yeah, we may, numerous? we may, but I, I strongly believe that the regime still have enough, has enough capacity to deal with this uh, mass demonstrations or something like that. They can apply some mixture of concessions and threats and if, like, if one region is especially restful, mm -hmm. they can stop mobilizing there, okay? Yeah. <laughs> right. right. Uh, they have demonstrated, over the past decade, we have quite a lot of protests in Russia. And the regime has demonstrated that it's quite good at mixing these concessions to one part of protesters with the threats to other part of protesters mm -hmm. and just tackling them quite successfully. Right, right. So if not with the public revolt or something like that, how would you comment the rumors uh, about internal clashes between the Siloviki in Russia, uh, between the military, Wagner, oligarchs? Uh, is something like this uh, in possibly to be the cause for Putin's end? Or? Indeed, there are clashes between various parts of security establishment, between Wagner, Kadyrov, Ministry of Defense, all this stuff, but they are clashing for money and influence. They are not clashing against Putin regime. They, ha they have no political agenda. And actually their ability to clash, their resources, depend uh, on the existence of Putin's regime. They are completely dependent on that. They are all supporters of Putin's regime deep inside. They just don't like each other, but they are quite okay with the overall structure. Oh, right. Uh, so let's go from the situation in Russia and the war to the Western Balkans. Uh, what can you tell us about the role of Russia in the region? Is the war in Ukraine draining Kremlin's resources and limiting its capacity to act? Or are we to expect maybe a, even a more aggressive posture uh, here in the Western Balkans? Uh, I'd say it's rather draining Kremlin's resources because First of all, it's uh, draining Kremlin's attention. Because the power structure in Russia is very vertical. And unless the person on the very top gives some order, uh, people on the lower levels of hierarchy will not act. Uh, so uh, as, uh, the, as Putin now is completely absorbed with the war in Ukraine, he, just, uh, he does not have capacity to follow closely the developments in other regions uh, and uh, what we see from uh, the people responsible for the Western Balkans in the Russian regime now, that they're just reproducing old uh, narratives from the pre-war times, very uncritically, as if nothing is happening in Ukraine, there is, as if there is no economic war between uh, Russia and Europe, as if there is no uh, sanctions, energy decoupling, as if nothing is happening. Uh, they, they keep uh, repeating the same narratives they, they, they applied to Western Balkans in just a year ago or two years ago, or even five years ago. Right, so, but talking about the sanctions, because Serbia is yeah, well, the only country that hasn't aligned with these sanctions and there is a lot of talk here whether they will align or not and uh, there were some speculations that the government was buying time uh, with the formation of the new government as using it as an excuse not to align and that this will happen now but you know it's not really in sight if we look at uh, statements of the new old uh, prime minister and so on so w what do you think would be actually Russia's reaction to that, if Serbia aligned? Uh, it very much depends on the way Vucic manages to package this alignment. Yeah, because uh, because it, now it has already become a purely symbolic step. Uh, de facto, Serbia has already aligned with European sanctions just because Serbian economy is completely integrated with the European one, mm -hmm. and Serbian companies and Serbian businesses are not able to ignore European sanctions and act if they do not exist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we we already seen this happening with Sberbank leaving, for example, yeah. the Serbian market. Uh, nice here with, with its Gazprom ownership is leaving on borrowed time for sure. It's a question of months or maybe at most several years. You know, it, it, it will have to be sold by Russians. Mm. Uh, not because Serbia would jo will join sanctions, just because uh, Serbia is surrounded by European states and is not able to ignore European sanctions. Mm. Uh, so um, if Vucic manages to package it in the way which is not humiliating for Russia, I think it will be quite okay with the Kremlin. But is it true then in that <laughs> sense that uh, I understand this very well, but, but isn't it then true that it might have been better if Serbia aligned immediately? Um, because, uh, you know, it's one thing to uh, betray, if you're betrayed from the Russian position, betrayed uh, entre guillemets, uh, by someone who is perceived as an adversary, is the other thing if you're betrayed by somebody who hasn't aligned and has been seen as your friend. I think the Vucic's key goal here is to portray it not as a betrayal at all, yeah, as a just a fourth step he, had to, he has to take because of unprecedented Western pressure, and even for Russia's sake, maybe. Yeah? Like, he has been framing, for example, the potential nationalization of Nice in a very pro-Russian sense that we're going to take it temporarily mm. just to keep it all right till Russia is able to return and take it back after the sanctions are lifted. But it's absolutely clear that the sanctions won't be lifted anytime soon. But still, the way it is packaged, it's, it's very flattering to Russia. And, uh, you know, the stakes for Russia in the Balkans have never been very high. Mm. And it's rather about appearances, you know, that we, Russia need to appear as powerful, influential, and as one which is still loved in Serbia, at least. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if Vucic manages to, to, to adhere to these basic principles, Russia need, need, <laughs> needs him to observe. I think it will be, everything will be okay. And I don't know whether, uh, whether it was better for him to, to join all the sanctions at the very beginning. I, I'd rather say no. Mm -hmm. Just uh, doing the, this step by step, he is decreasing the painfulness of the steps for, for Russia. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. at least psychological painfulness. Just Russia is facing more and more problems, so it's not perceiving in such a sensitive way the anti-Russian steps of Belgrade. Right. But talking about him, is Moscow perceiving the Serbian president Vucic as a friend, an enemy, or a Western guy, or is the situation, as they would say on Facebook, more complicated than that? Yeah. I say that the Kremlin, of course, I don't know what's going on in Putin's brain, and right. this is currently the main factor in Russian foreign policy. <laughs> uh, but judging by signals we, we receive, uh, that the Kremlin is quite happy with Vucic. Mm. I don't think that the Kremlin believes Vucic to be a friend of Russia, a sincere friend of Russia. I think in, in the Kremlin's opinion, Russia has no sincere friends at all anywhere in the world. <laughs> uh, but uh, at least Vucic is um, allowing Russia to save face in the region. Mm -hmm. And this is appreciated. Mm -hmm. That he is coordinating all his even anti-Russian steps closely with the Kremlin. This is also appreciated. There are no negative surprises coming from him. This is also appreciated. Mm -hmm. And given he keeps doing it this way, I, I, I don't see any backlash coming from Russia. Mm. Thank you very much, Maxim. Uh, this has been a really instructive uh, discussion and uh, I hope we'll have more. And uh, since you're now here with us in Belgrade, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me.